good evening. It is um, Monday, March 16th, 2020 at 7.03 p.m. and I call this meeting of the Lansing City Council to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Betts. Here. Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Garza. Here. Councilmember Hussein. Here. Councilmember Jackson. Here. Councilmember Spadafor. Here. Councilmember Spitzley. Here. Councilmember Wood. Here. There are eight members present at quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Is there anybody um, that council or mayor or the clerk would like us to keep in our thoughts during the meditation and Pledge of Allegiance? Council Member Wood. Thank you. Um, if we could uh, remember the family of Ron Seca. Ron Seca is a retired Lansing Police Department detective who passed away from cancer. He um, had recently retired and um, has been battling cancer and died this past week. So if we could remember he and his family, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Betts. As we make our deliberations this week and in the coming weeks, I think we need to uh, keep in mind all these service workers and all the other workers who are going to be laid off or otherwise not have jobs or and the people who are going to be working during these trying times. I think that um, we we appreciate everybody's service and we, we need to make sure that we can, as this council and as this body, serve them to the utmost integrity. It is so very important during these trying times that we make sure that they're taken care of. So thank you. And I would also, I would add to that, first responders and health care providers and those suffering from the ongoing coronavirus, make sure we keep them in our thoughts is they are the ones uh, battling this on the front lines for our communities. So, any, anyone else? Mr. Councilmember Jackson. And I would add our security staff, VK security over there, especially Coach Caper in the corner. I know he's been keeping us safe for this whole time, so thank you. Thank you. Please rise. You have for your approval the printed council proceedings of February 24th. Vice President Hussein. Yes, I would move the uh, printed council proceedings of February 24th, 2020 as uh, presented. It's been moved. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carries. And we are to the consideration of late items. Mr. Vice President. I move uh, the suspension of council rule number nine uh, in order to consider late items, which will be considered as part of the regular portion of the meeting to which they relate. Uh, the following items are as follows. Number one, a resolution suspending council rule 46 and allowing for virtual participation in council meetings. Resolution extending the mayor's declaration of an emergency until April 10th, 2020. A resolution approving Brownfield plan number 75. A resolution approving an obsolete property rehabilitation exemption certificate for 1611 East Kalamazoo Street. Um, a resolution pertaining to a deficit elimination plan, special assessment capital project fund, the issuance and sale of 2020 limited tax general obligation bonds for capital improvements, a resolution pertaining to the, to the issuance and sale of refunding of building authority bonds and tax increment finance authority bonds, a resolution pertaining to the issu issuance and sale of limited tax general obligation refunding bonds, uh, and the adoption of Lansing City Council COVID-19 exposure mitigation measures. Thank you, Council Member Vice President Hussein. I'll just add one modification. Item three was Brownfield Plan number 79, not 75. Just want to make sure, regardless. I heard 75, but just want to make sure it's on the record correctly. Thank you. Um, so this is an item that requires six votes, so we'll call the roll. Clerk. Mm. Mr. Uh, Council Member. Uh, Could you explain to the audience listening uh, why we're have all these late items, I would appreciate it. Thank sure. You. All the late items have to do with the fact that we're planning on having a meeting next week, but the governor has just ordered a, a mandatory restriction of gatherings to fewer than 50 people. 
and also the mayor has closed down City Hall during a state of emergency, so we're trying to minimize the amount of times that City Council has to meet over the next few weeks, um, and all these items um, are items that need to be acted on before we would next meet, should our next meeting be canceled. So we are looking to move those forward quickly um, and um, feel comfortable in, in at least considering them for that action this evening. You. You're welcome. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Or do you need, all those opposed? Do you need a roll call vote? Motion carries. Okay. We are to special ceremonies and presentations, and we have a number of presentations. The first one is regarding SLU 3 of 2019. Uh, Council Member Spitzley, is anyone here to present on 1315 Massachusetts Avenue's parking lot in the B residential zoning district? It is my understanding that they are not. Oh, oh there okay, he there he is. Okay. You got to raise your hand before I speak. <laughs> come Sir, on down. if you could come down to that table, um, click the button and make sure that your, um, your green light on is on and give us a brief de uh, description of what, what we're looking at. Okay. <clears throat> my name is Roger Donaldson. I'm the architect for the project. Uh, Capital Area Community uh, Services runs Head Start at the old Grand River Elementary School. They want to purchase uh, one parcel that used to have a house on it. It was taken down by the land bank some a year or so ago. And they wish to use it for parking. Uh, part of the project also will be to split about eight feet off because previously the two homes shared a drive. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to or be able to sell, or the land bank would then sell the eight feet on the north side to the adjoining property owner so they could then have a drive for their property and place to park. Um, we're going to provide about 11 new parking spaces. The need is there's just more staff for the elementary school, or the, for the Head Start. When the school was built, you had one teacher per class. With Head Start, you have three staff per class. So there's just an abundant a need for more parking there. So with this one vacant piece of property, it's right adjacent to the other parking on the property. So I'm here available for questions. Thank you. Are there questions from council members? Uh, council member Spitzley. Um, not just, not more of a question, just a statement. It is also my understanding that, um, you know, the, the neighborhood has been canvassed around there and they are generally supportive. Um, and then that, that little piece um, that you talked about, the eight feet piece is is like is um, is a buffer between the parking lot and the home next door to We're, it. Right, it'll be a buffer, and then we will be installing on our property a fence and some vegetation too to help buffer the prop or the residents to the north. Other questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Okay, okay our second presentation is regarding Z9 2019. Council Member Spitzley, the folks here are anyone We were here? told we were told that those folks from FTZ Labs would not be showing up. Okay, very good. And uh, next is Brownfield Plan Number Seventy Nine. Have uh, representatives from the Michigan Realtors here? There are extra chairs uh, there if you need them. Please, if you could introduce yourselves by name and then uh, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here, please. Uh, thank you. My name is David Pearson, representing the Michigan Realtors. On my left, your right, is Brian Western, who's the general counsel for the Michigan Realtors. And next to me also is J.P. Buckingham from Triterra, who is the environmental firm that prepared the Brownfield Plan that's before you tonight. Um, in brief, to introduce you to the Michigan Realtors, who have had a headquarters for many years in the city of Lansing, it's an organization with 30,000 members around the state, and they want to bring them here. It's an organization that works through committees, task forces, uh, and also in the last few years has dramatically expanded its continuing education programs. And the difficulty is, is that the current building is really at best set up for staff only, Meetings are extremely difficult. The building's been renovated twice, uh, and there's really not anything more to do with it. Um, what we're hoping with this brownfield to do is two things. One is to have a third, the first two floors would be sufficient for staff and to allow them to work in a better environment. It's the third floor that's the focus. 
that is, space for continuing education and for events as well, both for the realtors and then for other statewide organizations who are looking for space, frankly, to bring their members to Lansing as well. In addition, we have worked with the um, Lansing Public Service Department on a streetscape plan. Um, it started out with initially expanded landscape simply along the realtor side of the street. Um, and I realize you, you don't, you, I think you have in your packet all of the photographs. I don't know if there's, there we're not being um, considered. It initially started with an improved streetscape on the, it would be on the east side of Washington and the block. We met with Andy Kilpatrick, who pointed out, frankly, there's a difficulty. We're going to come through in somewhere between five and 10 years and replace the sewer there and kill all of those trees and take apart your sidewalk. So what he suggested was a cooperative plan, which is what's proposed here. And that would have the realtors as part of this project redo the streetscape on both sides at the corner. Washington Avenue at the corner of Saginaw is two extra lanes, lanes wide, the way it was when it was a two-way street. Saginaw is not planned to be a two-way street for in anybody's plans. And so the idea is to change the lanes and to bring the curbs in and to plant those areas to put in the sort of paving that we have in Rio Town and in different places in Old Town in order to improve the streetscape. That will go as far about a third of the block on both sides, meaning that on the one side, the Realtors headquarters, on the other side, Durant Park. Um, and it would be a real improvement for Durant Park. When public service comes through and does the sewer work, they will then complete the streetscape for the remainder of the block. So that would give us a coherent streetscape and frankly do two things. One, it's the first real project for the Saginaw Corridor, um, which everybody has been hoping would produce something. Um, this is quite real. The other thing that it does is that Washington from that point is the road to Old Town. And only the block at Grand River has been improved in Old Town. This would then start this at the southern end with the hopes that in the future that could be extended through the remaining blocks. That's in, in basic terms of the plan. Um, the plan as proposed would allow the funding of those improvements. The realtors would pay for those and be pay, paid back over the course of nine years as projected um, through the tax increment financing that's in the plan. Um, I guess I'd like to give Brian a minute to tell you a little bit more about the association. Thank you, council members. So one of the things that we're really excited about with Michigan Realtors is obviously that third, third floor. Um, currently, uh, with our education endeavors and sort of ramping up our value proposition to member membership, we end up having a lot of our education off-site. Um, in other in other cities, quite frankly, because we have to have a regional aspect to the the real tours around the state. Uh, this would provide us with a central location and the space to bring uh, upwards of 250 people into our building um, to have those education sessions and obviously to also um, you know enjoy the other aspects of Lansing. You know the many partners that we have. Uh, with the catering obligations that we currently have, we look forward to enhancing those um, and working with the various partners in Old Town, Rio Town, and Lansing proper. So. The one thing I should add in terms of the streetscape is, is that there is currently a large driveway um, on Saginaw which will be closed. That will be landscaped and screened and the parking will be pushed back and will be smaller. And so the Saginaw streetscape will also be pretty dramatically improved through these improvements. Um, I think in terms of the brownfield, if you have questions, um, JP's here to address those, and I don't know if you want him to go through any summary. Why don't you do a summary for the council, if yeah. you could, please? Yeah, that PowerPoint could and we'll put the PowerPoint back yeah. up. <clears throat> Takes a minute. So, um, 
So going back, uh, this gives you an idea of the location of the property. Sir, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you could. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not ideally set up for this. <laughs> That's fine. Gotcha. So uh, this gives you a visual. Um, and in your packet, you should have had a, uh, some other pictures on the end of it of what the proposed building is going to look like and, and other locations as well as the actual street and how it's going to be uh, narrowed down. But uh, really quick, it just indicates uh, the eligible status of it being a uh, functionally obsolete building. Um, that corner building right there is what was identified as functionally obsolete, 700 North Washington on se uh, September 17th. It uh, gives you a little bit of heating, cooling systems, the, what, what makes that building not functional. <clears throat> uh, overall, it's a, it's a nine year plan. Um, of, of the $99,200,000 of investment, uh, $536,276 is what's currently proposed for reimbursement to the developer. Um, it's going to be demolition of the functional absolute building. And the entire uh, 1.46 acres will be redeveloped to include the three-story uh, 19,443 square foot uh, building. Uh, we talked a little bit about third floor um, treats, uh, streetscape. Uh, improved landscaping sidewalks is, is, is a big component to it. Um, uh, and, and obviously the visible gateway property. Real quick here on your uh, taxes. Uh, you see the portion that's being passed through the Saginaw Street corridor improvement, uh, which is um, one of, is the first project to uh, uh, that we can take advantage of to improve the uh, Saginaw Street. Um, uh, see what's being passed through to school debt, Capital Area District Library portion captured by the Lansing Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, and as well as the portion that's being captured for their administration and their local Brownfield Revolving Fund. And this gives you an idea, just a breakdown of the uh, non-environmental activities of uh, estimated. You see the infrastructure improvements of that 163,000 is um, uh, going to the public improvement. Uh, contingency of the unknown, 0% uh, interest is being captured. And that gives you the breakdown. There's a picture of that location, building, some other photos of the area. There's that drive you were talking about, David. Uh, yeah, landscaping, uh, the treescape along Washington. And this is another visual of the, of what that, um, the, what the street's gonna look like and what's proposed there. And I think that also narrowing that down, you know, you walk through that sidewalk right now, it's pretty, quite a distance to get from one area all the way to the Durant Park. So I think shrinking that will make a big difference. Um, and that's, that's to the most what we're gonna do. Very good. Thank you. Are there questions from the council members? Council member Betts. Uh, in times of municipal financial duress, it's really important that we ensure that we have as much revenue as possible coming into the city. Uh, with this brownfield, we would be in essence not be collecting revenue from you in exchange for some project benefits, some projected benefits. Now that money would otherwise be going towards public services. So what are you providing within this brownfield that is a benefit to the people of Lansing beyond just landscaping? And that's the question I have for you. Um, really, I would point to two things in particular, and I should point out that the current taxable value of the combined properties is $400,000. And the estimated taxable value when the project is completed, if it's built out to its full size as proposed here, would be two to two and a half. So you're not gonna build the building if you don't get this brownfield? That's what you're claiming? It would, it would be substantially modified. How so substantially modified are we talking? The third floor that really is what we're looking at, that plus the streets. How much would that reduce the taxable value of the building? There's not an exact number, but the big difference that it would make is that we would not be bringing people here from around the state for meetings. So currently, what we have is a fairly inadequate space for staff. We could rebuild and build an adequate space, uh, space for staff, which would make them more effective, 
but we're still in a position where members from around the state don't come here. Um, and as it is, they're in the unfortunate position of repeatedly holding meetings elsewhere when they really want them here. It brings people here uh, using the restaurants and then the realtors also, as Brian mentioned, for their catering, use local vendors. In fact, I think you have a letter from one of the caterers as well as uh, a letter from uh, the people who we use for graphics uh, as well as for the um, educational materials that are used in the continuing education programs. So it really allows, we think, a benefit in that sense, not just on the property tax side, where there are immediate pass-throughs, um, but also in terms of the people we bring here. The total investment would be $9.2 million. The total brownfield is uh, 500, about $550,000. And so it's a, it's a relatively small percentage. You had asked in the committee meeting, and, and I would repeat it, well, so how does that make the difference? And the answer is when you're trying to do the next thing to get to the next level, every increment makes a difference. Uh, and so that's really the difference that this makes. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Mayor, and then the folks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I, I want to play the role of LEAP. Uh, LEAP is not here. They are not coming in, so I want to play the role of LEAP. And, and, and Councilwoman Spitzley has their analysis. I, I want to add to that, not to go back and forth, but um, we also, as a result of our brownfield policy, which we initiated middle of end of last year, there is a 10% pass-through. So with the, with the brownfield plan in place, uh, everything going upwards, yes, a lot of it is captured and, and everything Mr. Pearson says is correct. But there's also a 10% pass-through, so not only us, but the county and everyone else that gets captured will see an increase. It's not the same increase, and again, if the project wasn't done or the third floor wasn't done, it would be different numbers. But there will, there will still be that increase, and if the LEAP staff were here, they would point that out. Thank you. Council Member Spitzley, then Council Member Wood. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and to add on to uh, what the mayor was saying, we do have a letter of support from LEAP. For this Brownfield plan, we have a letter of support from um, the chair of the Lansing Brownfield Redevelopment Authority, and we also have a letter of support from the Greater Lansing Convention and Visitors Bureau. So those are all in your packets. Um, a couple other things to point out is that it's for a not it's for nine years. Is that correct? Yes. So um, so after nine years, you know, the building hopefully will still be viable and it fully goes on the tax rolls. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to um, I wanted to make. Well, that I think that was the important thing that it is it is for ten years or nine years, and then after that, um, it you know the full taxable value goes back on the tax rolls. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Council Member Wood. Thank you. I have a question, but before I um, ask my question, I just want to make sure um, and declare that I was endorsed by the Greater Lansing. Realtors Association. Uh, this is the Michigan Realtors Association, so there is a difference. So I did want to make sure that that was out there and ask the city attorney if he sees any conflict so that I can move forward with my question. Me too. No, not on that. those grounds. Uh, obviously, any council member can raise the issue and ask for a vote. So. Yeah, okay. Having made that declaration, um, the question I have is um, the agreement that was signed with LEAP for the Brownfield um, also includes the union labor mm -hmm. um, piece in that is, and was that signed by um, you as part of that? Yes, the Universal Development Agreement yes. in the city's form has been signed. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And obviously we intend to abide by that agreement. All right, thank you. I want that on the record. Thank you very much. Council Member Hussein. Just for the record, if I missed it, I, I apologize. Uh, in terms of the $536,000 of uh, eligible capture, can you tell us how much the public benefit, um, or I should say how much of that is comprised uh, with public benefit uh, expenditures? I guess to be fair, the direct public benefit in terms of the streetscape yes. is $163,000. We think the public benefit is larger than that. Um, well, I should say, the, the portion that the realtors actually take, once you take out the various administrative fees and pass-throughs that go to LEAP and to the um, uh, Brownfield Authority, is substantially lower than the 536000 And the plan doesn't include any interest. 
Um, but beyond that, it would be the other changes, closing the driveway on Saginaw, replanting that whole area, because there's an LCC parking lot between us and Grand Avenue. So we, don't, we can't remake everything, but once you go down Saginaw, as it comes down the hill to Grand Avenue, you're right there where you can get onto the river trail that's on the west side. Um, I think LEAP has some hopes that we can come back with something else later um, in order to make an even better connection, but at least it dramatically improves that portion. And I can tell you for people who are pedestrians along Saginaw, it makes a big difference not having that opening, trying to figure out where the cars are coming at you. And just very quickly, I, I want to thank the administration as well as our economic development team, uh, both in planning as, as well as LEAP. Um, I think, you know, if you look at 5400 Dunkel, if you look at uh, the EDS um, uh, project on West Holmes and, and now this, I think this is significant. Um, this, is, this is something new we've seen over the last year or two uh, in terms of the public benefit piece. I think um, it's huge. I think we have long uh, discussed innovative ways uh, of making these types of things happen so that we are um, seeing, you know, adjacent properties, you know, property values rise, uh, so that we're seeing blight elimination, so that we're seeing, uh, you know, enhancement of, of um, areas and things of that nature. So I really appreciate this piece. Thank you. I have a couple things, and then we're going to move on to Councilmember Wood and Councilmember Betts, and then we'll close this out. Um, two things. One, when, can you talk about the brownfield eligible activities as it pertains to an obs functionally obsolete building? You're talking about your building or the one next to it where you'll be building the new building, or both? It's the, 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 the building on the corner is the one which the assessor termed functionally obsolete. And that would be where the brownfield, the brownfield eligible activity is, is tearing that building down? Yeah, so the demolition is there, but in addition, there's site work, the site work on the well. entire okay. because there's a much larger parking lot that was there with the, um, the Gary building. Gotcha. Um, and so it is adjoining, <coughs> adjoining and a functionally or a adjoining and ambiguous. Sorry. When you have a one parcel is considered the brownfield, it's functionally obsolete, then you also have the adjoining and uh, contiguous parcels that, go that allow the whole development that parking lot included. okay yeah. Thank I, you. I should mention it takes in there are there were th three um, very rundown houses on Madison mm -hmm. and those were bought and demolished mm -hmm. in order to make them part of the site so that the whole block can be redeveloped they were simply beyond savings in, in my final question I've heard um, I've had in discussions with um, with you all the um, efforts you're making towards environmental friendliness of your facility. Can you speak to that briefly? It's a, primarily it is dramatically improving the landscaping to rebuild the parking lots in a way that will improve the drainage. In addition, the um, sewer and water will be upgraded um, on the site. Um, the building itself, the third floor, has substantial planting on it, which is planned. It's not a true green roof in the sense that um, it takes the drainage and treats it all there. Um, I don't know how to describe it other than we couldn't afford one of those. Right. Um, but it really adds quite a bit on the third floor as well. Okay, thank you. Council Member Wood. With the addition of the landscaping, is that something then that you will be maintaining um, in the future or is that something that you're expecting the city to maintain? Uh, that will be maintained by the realtors if you go past the current building, um, uh, when we were asking the assessor to come, one of the WAGs at Triterra said you might want to get out there with some Roundup because they do such a dramatically great job with their landscaping. I'm hoping that if you get a chance to look at that, it'll give you an idea of what they'll be doing in the future. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Betts. Thank you, President Spadafore. Uh, one last question. What, so having people come into the city is great, but I want to make sure that they're spending money in the city as well. That's an important part of an economic impact. So what, what plans do you have in place to ensure that your conference attendees are spending money in the city? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Oftentimes these types of events, uh, whether education and or convention type um, events, they will have overnights. Um, obviously, we're going to be we're going to be ramping up the use of our catering vendors, um, which will also lead to an increase in spending on that front. But the goal would be to bring people to Lansing to familiarize them with the central location, um, whether they're overnighting. Um, obviously, uh, we have residents 
of our staff that live in Lansing, but we also have people that um, come in, obviously, just for the work day. Um, the experience that our staff has had in the current building, without a doubt, has sort of um, exhausted uh, many of the staff members, so they're very excited about this new, this new project. But it goes without saying, if you look at, go back to the landscape question, Michigan Realtors, in the course of the last 10 years, has invested a substantial amount in that Saginaw to Madison block um, because we do believe that Durant Park needs to uh, be a focal point for families and for people to recreate, and we want that to be beautiful. We want the, the streetscape to be beautiful, and we want it to be a draw. We want it to be a gateway to go into Old Town, and we want it to be uh, some, something that people uh, view as transformational on that corner. Very cool. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, we thank you for your time this evening. Appreciate it. Our next presentation is SLU regarding SLU 1. Is Council Member Spitzley, do we anticipate? Thank you, Mr. President. Do we have anybody here for regarding the tower? Not you down. Don't. Oh. <laughs> This is for a special land use permit for um, 12, between 1220 and 1306 North Homer Street Telecommunications Tower Metro Fibernet LLC. They will be leasing property from the Lansing Board of Water and Light. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So like you said, we're, we're leasing a small piece of property on uh, the BWL old pump site. Um, I'm a, my name is Jim Rood. I'm a project manager overseeing construction for uh, fiber. Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Yes. Rood, just real quick. Um, the, there's information in your packet and pictures and stuff for, as well. Yeah, I'm so. sorry. I don't I'm, I'm sorry. Please wait. proceed. <laughs> Apologize. That's okay. Um, I'm a project manager overseeing construction of a fiber a network. We're putting in and around the city of Lansing. Um, part of this development is this small site we're putting in some communication huts which house our router switches multiplexers equipment i probably can't even turn on so this goes to our customer and we're asking for a special use permit for this pole it's a large metal pole it's, it's it'll stick out of the ground 79 feet and we've repurposed it to um, hold a uhf and a dhf antenna this only receives um, local channels that we will use to give to our customers. So that's basically it in a nutshell. Are there any questions for our friends here from Metronet? Council Member Wood. Um, one of the things that when we adopted the ordinance on cell towers was the commingling. Are you going to have any commingling on your tower or is it? just for your use just for our use we don't have any small cells we don't have any microwave anything on it just for us okay thank you any further questions council member jackson thank you president for how does it look just a metal pole sticking up can you describe how it looks it's i didn't know him. yeah it's it's like a big it's a big wooden telephone pole but it's made out of metal it's it's 90 feet in length, we, we bury 11 feet of it, and so 79 feet is above ground. But it's it's a class H2 pole, I guess, if you want to classify it, or that's the class it is. Thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is regarding the Oprah certificate for 1611 East Kalamazoo Street Allen neighborhood center holdings yes, and we Dawn, have... if you'd like to join us at the table so this is this is for the um, the certification for the Oprah they've already had their Oprah designation and so um, this tonight the action will be on the, the certification. certification right thank you and thank you all for the opportunity to come and uh, speak in support of this um, you know, as uh, Council Member Spitzley pointed out, we were here in the fall and you approved um, the 1600 block for a district designation. Now we need the certificate. Um, all of this will make possible the creation of Allen Place. And uh, as most of you know, at this point, Allen Place is a 
project that we have been describing as at the intersection of health and food and housing and environmental innovation. Um, we in intend to uh, renovate the existing two-story building um, as well as build a new 10,000 square foot, three-story three tall uh, west wing, a new build on the, on the western end of the, of the existing complex. What that will enable us to do is to offer 21 units of age-friendly and uh, mixed income apartments, four studio, nine one, one bedroom and eight two bedroom. Um, and in addition, it, it, that actually totals a little over 18,000 square feet of housing. In addition, we will be able to uh, fill about 24,000 square feet of commercial space. As most of you know, um, Allen Neighborhood Center has been the nearly the sole occupant in the Kircher Complex, what was formerly known as the Kircher Complex, for at least a year and a half. Most of the uh, building has been empty for 10 years. The upstairs, the second floor of the current building, has been completely empty for nearly 15 years. Um, it was visited by the assessor who declared it functionally obsolete some months ago. Um, and at this point, truly, Allen Neighborhood Center occupying that middle swath is just about the only entity uh, on the block. Um, we're excited about the possibility of age-friendly housing. We know that there's a shortage of housing that is both age-friendly and affordable for people on the east side who are 55 and older. They will not be the exclusive occupants of this development. We will, though, uh, in make sure that we let a lot of those people who are interesting, interested in uh, living in a complex um, where design facilitates social interaction, gives them access to a lot of services, online services, uh, you know, community room, uh, access to uh, computers, an online, uh, actually a, a weekly on-site farmer's market, tons of cooking workshops and gardening workshops and whatnot. Um, but there will be the full life cycle represented in that complex. Um, the commercial entities, um, at this point, number about seven, and they are primarily food and health-related entities. Um, we're really excited um, to be opening uh, in one of those uh, ground floor units an accelerator kitchen for graduates of our incubator kitchen program. The first four to occupy the accelerator have already been selected. We're excited. They're excited. Um, and in addition, we're uh, looking at uh, inking leases with uh, a small grocery, uh, a health-related enterprise, a culinary school, uh, and an ice cream shop. That was for me. <laughs> and uh, it will be the death of me. <laughs> but in any case, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. So um, you all know that we are a small nonprofit. Um, and so uh, having an OPRA helps a whole lot with cash flow uh, for, this, for this project and for the ultimate feasibility of the entire project. So I'm open to questions. Are there any questions for Joan? Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Just uh, um, noting for the record that we have a letter here from LEAP um, in support of the consideration of the Obsolete Property Rehabilitation Act certificate for Allen Place. Uh, the, dur the duration is 12 years from the completion of the project. Um, and that's the comment I have. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Joan. Have a good thank day. Thank you. Okay, and we have... Um, our next presentation is for the payment of taxes for Porter Senior Apartments. Is anyone here from the Porter Senior Apartments wishing to speak? No, they are, they are not here. Very good. Thank you. Moving on. Okay, we are two comments by council members on the city clerk. I'm sorry, Mr. President, before we move on, um, just to kind of for like a procedural thing. So for the um, entities that were not here, 
um, to provide testimony for the public hearing. We're just going to kind of let it let it lay and keep it keep it open. Is that is that the word I need to use? Uh, I've had I had a conversation with the attorney for one of the uh, presentations, also scheduled for a public hearing on Porter Street. The client is out west and couldn't make it. Uh, I see no reason why you couldn't open the public hearing, take whatever comments there are, and then but there is, there is continue it. Okay, and we're going to do that for both, both the FTZ labs and for the porters. So we're just going to hold it open, and so, so at which time they can come and make a presentation, and then we'll we'll move it then. Yeah, move it to a definite date. Though. Yeah, right. So you don't have to re-notice it. Yeah. Are there any comments by council members? Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Clerk, sorry. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. I just want to thank all of my election workers and everyone who worked so diligently to make our election last week a success. Uh, with everything that has happened in the past week, it feels like it was an entire lifetime ago. <laughs> so it's hard to believe it was only um, six days ago. Um, but. Thank you for, uh, for everyone who participated. Um, a lot of hours uh, go into an election. Uh, this was a true test uh, with the implementation in a large turnout election of the changes brought about by Proposal 3. Uh, we had, uh, rather than the dozen or so people register on election day like we had in the city elections, we had in the hundreds. Um, so it, uh, I, I really uh, appreciate everyone's work and dedication. Uh, we are to community. Uh, Council Member Wood. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of cancellations. The Rejuvenating South Lansing that meeting is on March 24th has been canceled. We also received um, information from Churchill Downs uh, that their meeting is canceled. They have that, hold that at Wainwright School. Because the schools are canceled, their meeting is canceled as well. Also, I will note that the Joint Board of Water and Light meeting with the City Council Committee of the Whole for March 30th has been canceled as well. You should also be sorry, the Colonial Village and Neighborhood Association meeting uh, for this Wednesday has been canceled as well. Mr. Jackson, what would you like to cancel? My constituent contact meeting that's every fourth Saturday of the month is canceled. Anyone else want to cancel? Okay. Mr. Clark. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the audience with a community event that they would like to announce or to announce the cancellation of? <laughs> <laughs> um, we are to speaker registration for public comment on show cause hearings and legislative matters. Uh, show cause hearings is the green sheet, and uh, if you are the owner of that property, you would have received a notice at home, and you need to sign in in the next minute or so uh, if you wish to speak before the hearing. And then the uh, blue sign-in sheet is for uh, legislative matters, which includes all of the um, scheduled public hearings. It includes all of the resolutions for action on the agenda and the ordinances for adoption. And it does also include all nine of the late items. So uh, we'll be picking those up in just about a minute. Um, and uh, with that, we are to the mayor's comments. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to repeat what I talked about in uh, Committee of the Whole, but there's a whole variety of things that I, I want to add to it. Um, first, for all those watching, don't forget, good hygiene, social separation. If you don't know that already, then you are not reading the newspaper, you are not looking at the news, you're not talking to anybody, please do that. The city is, uh, as of tomorrow morning, under an emergency order. City, for city facilities will be closed. Um, you can go to lansingmi.gov slash coronavirus for uh, information on phone numbers and how you can reach city officials. Um, uh, our community centers are closed. Parks and recreation programming is canceled, so I'll add to the cancel parade. Um, fines for non-payment of fees during this time will be waived, um, so don't worry about that. Uh, we are working with the homeless shelters and hospitals to treat people who are sick and to make sure we're quarantining and hoteling. Um, there are newer problems which we're continuing to address, but we are working with all of those communities. If you want to see, if you are on a city of Lansing board or commission, um, 
you'll get notification, but we are canceling all of those unless there is urgent business. If there is something that's financial or a permit or a planning or something like that that needs to happen, then the meeting will happen. Um, but if it's not urgent business, then that will be canceled. If you're an advisory board, it will likely be canceled uh, unless there is decision making. Um, the food pantry, the mobile food pantry is still happening. We talked about this with precautions. Um, so that we will, we will announce in the next day or two so the public has that information. Um, we're working with the schools on the gap feeding program. Uh, the governor's office has been working with us. We're working with the health director. I've been in contact with the East Lansing mayor. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin has been fantastic. If you're a small business and you are having issues, Congresswoman Slotkin was part of an appropriation, so please call the Small Business Administration in Detroit or Grand Rapids, and they can help you with loans, or they can help you with other resources, or if you have a loan, they can extend it. So please talk to them if you're a small business and you are being hurt by this, which I assume you are. Uh, I think everyone knows bars and restaurants are, are closed, or uh, gyms, theaters, and other places where people are congregating. I will announce that the city was accepted to the Bloomberg Harvard Local Response Initiative for Coronavirus. Um, so we're going to be participating in that so we can work with other communities throughout the country. Um, I don't know much more about that because I just got the email about an hour ago. Um, and uh, the state does have a coronavirus hotline, which is 888-535-6136. Uh, or you can go to michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Um, so that's everything I'm going to add to what I said before. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Clark. Okay, we are to show cause hearings. We have one show cause hearing in consideration of orders to make safe or demolish 1522 West Holmes Road. Council Member Garza. Thank you, Mr. President. So what we have before us is a show cause hearing. Make safe or demolish 1522 West Holmes Road. The code enforcement officer noted to the committee that the single family home was in front of the demolition board on September 26, 2019 where they made a decision for a make safe or demolish in 30 days. The documents noted the building was valued at 52200 and the estimated cost of repairs came in at 119000 So concluded by stating they had, uh, the, I'm sorry, the code enforcement officer concluded by stating they had not had any contact with the owner and there has been no work or no application for permits. Uh, so then he then asked for a 60 days make safe or demolish. And with that, I'll move the resolution. The resolution has been moved by Council Member Garza. Is there further discussion on the res? I'm sorry. Just public <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are no members uh, sorry. signed in to speak on the show cause hearing, so do the referral of the show cause hearing number one. Uh, general claims. Well, public, public safety. safety. Okay, now we are to public comment on legislative matters. Uh, which does include, as I indicated, the late items, the resolutions for action, and the two ordinances, as well as the following public hearings. Number one, Z9, 2019, 3440 Northeast Street. Number two, SLU 1, 2020, uh, for 1220 and 1306 North Homer Street. Number three, obsolete property rehabilitation for 1611 East Kalamazoo Street. Number four, Brownfield Plan number 79700 North Washington. Number five, payment in lieu of taxes for Porter Senior Apartments. Number six, SLU 3 of 2019, 1315 Massachusetts Avenue. Number seven, uh, an amendment to chapter 294 to eliminate the requirement that the city attorney be the legal advisor to the Police and Fire Retirement Board. And number eight, an ordinance to eliminate the requirement that the city attorney be the legal advisor for the Employees Retirement System Board. And I believe we have had overviews of most of these. Yeah, let's move right. Okay. Does anyone, any council member need any further information on the public hearings in front of us? Okay, and the only... Council member Wood? I, I just wanted to state that we will be voting on the two public hearings dealing with the um, retirement boards this evening, yes. uh, later in the agenda. Council member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. Also, we will be voting on um, item A3 in consideration of the Oprah certificate for 1611 East Kalamazoo Street 
and also a four in consideration of Brownfield Plan number 79, 700 North Washington, Michigan Realtors Redevelopment Project. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, the, only, the two people that signed in, I believe, were uh, actually made their remarks under presentations, but I'll call them just to make sure I didn't make an error there. Uh, Roger Donaldson, do you have anything further to add? I don't know if it's proper or not, but since the Planning Commission recommended approval of our um, the special use permit, uh, and seeing that there's no other comments on it, I didn't know if there's a way that maybe this action on this could be taken tonight, seeing the City Hall would be closing, we won't have the Planning Committee meet again. Uh, I know it may be slightly out of step, but it would then allow the owner to continue with the purchase agreement with the land bank and to keep the project going forward. Thank you, sir. And uh, Miguel Rodriguez. Okay. Hello, I'm Miguel Rodriguez. I'm the director of Capillary Community Services, and I just want to say I want to thank the city for their continued support of this project. As far as what this project means to CACS, trying to put a face for both our staff and our parents, the biggest benefits we see of this project is one is it allows for uh, a safer area in terms of it will increase the amount of space that parents will have to drop off and pick up their children. It will also create additional space for our staff to park so that, as you all know, when you're loading or unloading your car with supplies and materials, sometimes it can get a little hectic and the door stays open a little bit longer. This allows staff to actually park in the parking lot, take care of their business, and not worry about traffic that is whizzing through the, the neighborhood. So in terms of it'll be safer for our staff. And finally, it continues our investment into that Grand River property. Uh, as I said, we've done some different repairs as far as the roof and some other landscape improvements, so this just adds to uh, building uh, within that community. So again, I want to thank you for your support, and that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Okay, that was our last uh, speaker, and uh, we are to the referral of the public hearings, number one, Z9-2019. Uh, we're going to hold that. Hold that public uh, hearing open until 427. Uh, number two, SLU-1 of 2020. Development and planning. I'm sorry, committee of the whole. Uh, number three, Oprah at 1611 East Kalamazoo Street. We're going to hold that for passage this evening. Uh, number four, Brownfield Plan number 79. Hold for passage. Um, number five, Pilot for Porter Senior Appointment. Hold that public hearing open until April 27th. Uh, SLU th number six, SLU 3 2019. Uh, Committee of the Whole. Number seven, uh, the Police and Fire Retirement System Board. Uh, that's front passage this evening. And number eight, the Employees Retirement System Board. Also for passage this evening. Okay, we are to legislative matters and resolutions for action by the Committee on General Services. Council Member Hussein. The first resolution before you pertains to a claim disposition. This is for claim number 1756 uh, for $4,955 in trash fees at 1320 uh, Vermont Avenue. We originally took this up in general services on February 25th, uh, and we learned that a roofing job uh, had taken place at this uh, particular address. Um, no permit had been pulled uh, for the job. There was no construction um, dumpster on site and shingles were, were left everywhere. They were left on the subject property, they were left on um, the adjacent neighbors, both to the east and to the west, uh, both of their properties. Uh, and so what ended up happening was, Code actually got a call uh, from both neighbors uh, to come out and take a look. Um, due to the number of shingles that were on the property, but also um, access and egress issues um, with the adjacent uh, properties, they actually ordered an emergency um, cleanup. And so our contractor arrived, I believe, on October 4th, uh, and they did a bait. They were authorized for, um, I, I can't remember how much they were authorized for, but in, in terms of the bill, I think there were 18, eight, 1,815 cubic yards of construction material that was billed to uh, the city. Um, the 
admin fee was 265 so uh, that amounted to 4955 that was charged uh, back to the applicant. There were really two issues we took a look at as a committee. Number one, uh, the individual before us was David Vincent, and the question was whether or not he had legal standing um, as, as the claimant and uh, part of our committee process. And the second piece uh, was that there was the contention that the amount of debris billed for was not the amount of debris removed. Uh, and so we did have the city attorney opine um, with regard to Mr. Vincent's legal standing. Uh, and it was, um, this is a very interesting case in that Mr. Vincent was the original contractor uh, for the roofing job. He subcontracted out the work. Um, in the middle of the process, he then was deemed to be the registered agent. Uh, and then on December 30th of last year, uh, he actually filed a transfer affidavit uh, with the city assessor's office. Um, and we have always been told as part of our general services uh, deliberations that the individual um, that is the owner at the time of the incident uh, is the only individual that has legal standing before the committee. And that if a subsequent owner wants to take issue with um, yeah, any fees uh, or fines from the city pertaining to that incident, they need to take it up with the prior owner um, or they need to go to small claims court. In this case, um, because of the unique aspect um, uh, aspects involved, uh, the city attorney's office did believe uh, that this individual had uh, legal standing um, to file the claim. Uh, the second piece uh, was that um, our housing inspector actually stepped up and said, look, you know, we, we only have one picture. Uh, it's a truck, 25 uh, yards of waste. It's clear um, that that truck is full uh, because our con contractor did not take pictures of the additional uh, debris that was removed. He actually suggested that we take the amount of cubic yards billed, I think it was uh, down from eight, 1,815 to 825 cubic yards. Uh, and so that is the motion that was considered, that was the motion that was approved uh, to grant the claim in the amount of $1,255 and, and to deny the balance of $3,700. So with that being said, I will move the, move the resolution. The resolution has been moved. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item B. Councilmember Hussein. This is a claim disposition, claim number 1757. This deals with AAA Properties, Inc. for $716.80. Uh, this was for an emergency board up at 1722 West Miller. Uh, you probably recall uh, there was a homicide uh, with four other gunshot victims. This was on October 27, 2019 on the 1700 block uh, of West Miller. There was a large party, uh, roughly 200 uh, individuals. Uh, the shooting occurred at about 1.30 a.m. Um, it should be noted that this property uh, has historic issues with large parties and things of that nature. In any event, uh, our on-call code officer was called out by the Lansing Police Department uh, due to the property being open and accessible. The Lansing Police Department, although they are not required to do so, um, they did work to contact the property owner. They were unable uh, to get a hold of the property owner probably because he was fast asleep. This was at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, in any event, um, at that point we did um, call out Pro Soil, who was our contractor. Um, they did perform the emergency board up. Uh, the $716 uh, is comprised of $316.80 in supplies, $135 in labor, uh, which um, uh, adheres to the provisions of the contract, and then also $265 in admin fees. Uh, our claims review committee did hear this on January 29th. Uh, they denied. We uh, had the applicant in. Uh, we saw no reason to grant the uh, appeal, uh, so we had we denied in full as well. So with that being said, I would move the resolution to deny uh, the claim appeal in the amount of $716.80. Motion before us is to deny the appeal. Is all those in favor, please say aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Item C, Council Member. This resolution deals with uh, claim number 1758. This is for Jesus De La Torre Vebra uh, for $4,271 in trash fees at 523 uh, Cherry Street. The incident date was, I'm sorry, August 28, 2019. The compliance date was September 4, 2019. We had our code uh, officers back out on the 5th uh, of that same month. Uh, the issues had not been abated, uh, and so we had our contractor out to abate on 9 20, 2019. Um, this property owner does have a history of trash and grass violations. Um, we did have the claimant into our general service committee on uh, February 25th. Uh, he admitted to leaving debris out uh, for months, I believe, a few months, um, because he was uh, out of town for work um, and also said that he was waiting for 
um, enough debris to fill a 40 yard dumpster, to have that dumpster delivered. Uh, two issues at hand here were number one, the claimant uh, had claimed he didn't get mailing in a timely manner, uh, and that although the claimant was denying he should be charged, uh, he has an issue, or not, sorry, denying he should be charged, he had an issue with the amount that he was being charged for. So again, we took a look at this on February 25th. Um, we found that all correction notices and subsequent bills uh, were sent to uh, the mailing addresses on record, that they were uh, sent in a timely manner. Um, there is a possibility, however, that this claimant was not receiving the mail in a timely manner uh, because he, we believe he lives elsewhere. And then the other piece was that um, there are a number of issues with his porch, missing steps, steps that are not safe. And so we believe that the post office may be having a difficult time uh, delivering his mail. Um, in any event, uh, pre-authorization was for 60 cubic yards of waste and 14 hours of work, uh, which is in line with um, uh, the work that was done and the work that was billed for uh, based on the pictures um, and, and the, other, the other evidence that we vetted, uh, we moved to deny the claim in the full amount of $4,271. Uh, so with that said, I'd move the resolution. Resolution for us um, is to deny the claim. All those in any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item D, Council Member Hussein. So the claim disposition number 1769, this is for Sue Lover for $2,763 in trash fees at 34 one zero South Waverly Road. This was a an interesting case. Um, this property and the adjacent property, which is the gas station at uh, West Holmes and South Waverly, uh, were cited for trash. Uh, and much of the trash was uh, in this this wooded ditch, uh, kind of in between the properties. Uh, but it was believed to be owned by the claimant. Uh, the claimant did provide uh, at the time of our committee deliberation surveys, uh, legal surveys. Uh, and we compare those against the photos of the debris built for, um, and it was apparent. It was apparent that the bulk of the um, debris that was removed was actually not on the claimant's property. Uh, so at that point, our housing inspector, who was Scott Sanford, um, uh, you know, he, he took a look at the photos, took a look at the surveys. Uh, we conferred uh, with uh, city council uh, and um, city attorney, uh, and he actually made the suggestion that um, we dropped the contractor fees, I believe it was to $195 for work completed, um, and, then, and then he wanted to maintain the administration fees. Uh, so that's where, if you look at the resolution, what we're looking to do is to grant the claim the amount of, I think it's 2,303, and to deny the balance of 460, which includes the admin fee and the 195 for debris removed from her, her property. So with that being said, I move the resolution. Resolution before us is to deny the claim, number 1769. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. The next resolution deals with claim number 1761. This is for a Michael Hot Wagner for $440 in trash fees at 1608 Comfort Street. Go ahead. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> Um, so we cited uh, for trash and debris on October 28th. The compliance date was November 4th. We rechecked on November 5th, and we had our contractor out to abate on November 7th. Uh, this deals with trash that was left between a, a very minimal amount of trash, as you can see, uh, between the sidewalk and the curb, so uh, in the public right away. In any event, uh, the reason for the appeal was that the claim, sorry, the claimant uh, said that uh, the, the mail wasn't received. Uh, and the other piece was he was arguing that he had put that out. We should have known he had put that uh, trash out um, for individuals to come. I think it uh, included plastic wheels. It included snowblower covers. I don't know if you guys can remember what else was out there. Uh, but they were things of value, and he was hoping that people would stop by and, and grab them. In any event, um, we did have the CRC vet this on January 23rd. Uh, they denied in full. Um, they had deemed that the mailing was, in fact, sent uh, correctly. Uh, and that all policies were filed with fidelity. We looked at it on March 10th. Uh, we learned that the claimants do uh, still own that property. They have actually moved to next door. Um, that it, as well as the trash being left at the curb was left in boxes and included plastic wheels, um, the snowblow covers and the like. Uh, the intention, you know, as we saw it was to provide items for free to the public, which we could appreciate. Uh, we had to explain, however, though, that it is still in violation of uh, code. Um, by the time the uh, contractor got out, two-thirds of the items have been, in fact, removed. Um, however, the $175 for contract services, that's actually the minimum amount um, because I, I believe that's one hour and three cubic yards of waste. So the $175 um, 
in terms of our housing inspector, that was the recommendation that we that we uh, denied the the claim and the amount of $175, but that we actually remove the administration fee. So, with that being said, I would move the resolution. The resolution before us is tonight claim 1761. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We are to the Committee on Personnel. Vice President Hussein. So this resolution deals with uh, council staff, fringe benefits, amendments, and personnel rule updates. The resolution is in your folder. I'm going to read very quickly um, from this. If you look at items one, two, and three, I'm sorry, one, two, three, and four, that's actually what I'm reading from. Uh, the resolution before you um, deals with, number one, the time bank um, and the elimination of the time bank, the council staff compens compensatory, comp I cannot say that word, uh, time bank program described in Article 4, Section B of the Council Staff Personnel Rules is eliminated, and the time bank balance that accrued prior to 2009 will no longer be available for use. Two, retirement health care. Uh, there should be no retiree health insurance plan or retire retirement health care for newly hired employees in the council staff positions on or after February 15, 2020. Three, pension plans, new employees hired on or after February 15, 2020 shall not be eligible for membership in or benefits under the employee's retirement system. Four, the new employees, employees who are eligible shall become participants in the city's defined contribution plan, which shall include the following defined contribution plan features. Um, mandatory employer pickup contributions, 5%. Employee one-time pre-tax uh, irrevocable pickup election of zero to 6%. A new provision that employer uh, will match the employee's voluntary one-time pickup election dollar for dollar up to a maximum of 6% compensation and that the vesting schedule for new employees will be 33% of the employer contribution account upon completion of one defined contribution plan year of service, 66% of employer contribution account with completion of two defined contribution plan years of service, and 100% of employer contribution account with completion of three defined contribution plan, sorry, uh, years of service. Other changes um, that we took a look at in terms of the personnel committee's uh, process dealt with um, Changes that were made in uh, April of last year, but they were never actually approved by this body, uh, deals with the striking of several positions that we either historically have not hired for um, or we haven't hired for in quite some time um, in, in all related language that pertains to those particular positions. Um, I'm sure Councilman uh, Spadafore put the bulk, the bulk of the, the uh, fringe benefit piece together, uh, so I'm sure that he will uh, have additional things to, um, to discuss. But with that being said, I would move the resolution. Is there any further discussion or questions from the committee members, from, from the council members, excuse me, council member Wood. And just to clarify, if someone were to come from a bargaining unit that was vested or had retirement into our system, into the council uh, staff, they would retain that. This is just brand new employees after February yeah. 15. 15, yeah. All right. Thank you. Other questions? All right, um, Council Member Hussein, would I take a motion? Or did we already do that? It, it's, it's been moved. Sorry, it's been moved by Council Member Hussein. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries, thank you. We are to the Committee on Public Services. Council Member Dunbar. Uh, the, the dais isn't exactly accessible. I have a one leg and two microphones. <laughs> um, okay. This is uh, the ordinance to eliminate the prohibition on street parking between two... Sorry, Council Member. Oh, no, this is the decertification of a line oh, driving Jesus. a portion of Technology Boulevard. Right. I'm off. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, I got it. I'm doing yours, Council Member Betts. Sorry about that. Um, street decertification, um, Alliance Drive, and a portion of Technology Boulevard. The gist of this is it's a road that we, um, we don't use anymore and is part of the construction of the new McLaren hospital system that's on the east side of town. 
um, the road technically doesn't exist anymore because it's already been torn up for construction, but we have to go through this process to decertify it at the state so that, and that affects our road funding and how it's allocated. So I move that. It's been moved by Councilmember Dunder. I'll just add that there, there was provision in the in the land deal that we would vacate the street only if and after the sale went through, and it's gone through. Obviously, there is a very tall uh, construction project on that site, so it's to decertify that. All, any further questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Okay, we are to the late items from the Committee on Development and Planning. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> the first item we have before us is um, Brownfield Plan Number 79 from the Michigan I, Realtors. Right. Um, yep. Okay, great. This is a um, nine-year uh, Brownfield plan. Um, they are going to invest $9.2 million to completely redevelop and expand their Lansing headquarters located at the corner of Saginaw Street and Washington Avenue. They provided a, their presentation here before us, so I won't go into all, you know, um, all of it, but the, um, some of the funds, um, they're asking to be reimbursed with new taxes generated by the plan. Um, the project includes the narrowing the entrance to Washington Avenue, um, sidewalk improvements, landscaping in the roads right away, and eliminating curb cuts on Saginaw and Washington. Um, these are public infrastructure improvements that will improve pedestrian and biker safety and better connectivity to LCC and downtown and Old Town um, and providing a better uh, connectivity between the River Trail and Durant Park. Um, and with that, um, because we've already had a presentation on it, I'm going to move the resolution. Um, the resolution before us is approving Brownfield number 79. Is there any further discussion? Do we need a roll call vote on this? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next item is the resolution approving Knopsley Property Rehabilitation Exemption Certificate for 1611 East Kalamazoo Street. Council Member Spitzer. What he said, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, it's 12 years from completion. Um, as uh, uh, we, had, um, we had a presentation uh, before us about Allen Place. And um, they came in last fall for the um, actual Oprah designation. And um, this action tonight will approve the, the Oprah certification. And with that, I'll move the resolution. The resolution is before us. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we are to the Committee of the Whole. First thing we have is the mid-year 20, the 2020 mid-year budget amendment, Council Member Hussein. Yes, yeah, so given to you just a short period of time ago is uh, a substitute uh, pertains to the economic development and planning parking system and a new fee uh, dealing with our street parking lot credit card uh, processing. So what I'm going to do is let the mayor at this point um, speak to this and then we'll take a look at uh, the broader amendment and passage. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. You want me to speak to the substitute? Please, substitute, yes. Yeah, and I, I apologize for this. This is, I'd say, sort of last minute, but it's an issue that is unrelated to the budget amendment, but is related to um, something we've been hearing a lot. Um, and I emailed everyone here, but I want to make sure for the record I can explain it. Um, uh, we instituted a new parking system, uh, mostly in our downtown, but everywhere, you know, with the app and, and anywhere you want to park where there's pay for parking. One of the things that we have heard, and I'm sure you all have heard continually, is you know, there's, a, there's a minimum of one hour in the app, and it's a maximum of two hours. So you know, why is the minimum an hour if you just want to stop in and get peanuts from the peanut shop or you know, stop in and buy you know, whatever, your tie from Kazachek's? Why is it an hour? We want to adjust that. Um, we also want to adjust um, some of the other parking issues. You know, people who are food service providers, they want to be able to park their cars on the street. Um, and, uh, and in the back, and, um, but they are restricted because of the way the app works out. Um, and then the time. Uh, our staff wants to be a little bit more flexible with time limits for parking. We're still going to be uh, the same two hours on Washington Square, so the traffic flows through. But on some of the side streets, they may make the time a little longer. And some of the areas not um, in, the, in the actual strict downtown, they might make the areas a little longer. We want to make all these changes, um, but to do that, we also want to be consistent with what they're doing in, in East Lansing and other areas um, by instituting uh, a 30 cent um, 
uh, credit card fee. So we want to institute a 30 cent credit card fee, which is the same thing you have in East Lansing, but we want to reduce the time from, from an hour to 15 minutes minimum. That way there won't be a, a, a revenue impact on the parking fund, but will be consistent with what's being done in our neighboring community and other communities. Uh, but I can't do that. Uh, I can't make these changes uh, alone. I'm not going to uni unilaterally create a parking fee that is done through council. Um, so as I think I've indicated to many people here, my, my hope is that we can have this substitute adopted and then adopted along with the, with the budget amendment. If there's anybody uncomfortable with this and would rather we pull it and do it as a, a standalone fee, I'm willing to do that also, but because of the, the timing and because we like to get this out to the businesses, um, especially downtown, who want to make these changes, uh, I'm asking for you to adopt that language in the substitute. Again, I'm not looking for controversy, so if there's any controversy, then I'll ask you to withdraw and we can do it separately at another time. But we have been pretty open about this. Uh, Kathleen Edgerly at DLI has put this out to, uh, to the business owners to let them know, and I haven't heard any, any complaints. In fact, I've had two business owners um, tell me that they're excited about this because it'll, it'll offer them more options and be more consistent with the neighbors. So um, that is my request. I, I appreciate your willingness to, to consider this. So before we can discuss whether we will uh, um, accept this or not, we're going to need a motion to adopt the substitute. Council Member Hussein. I would move the adoption of the substitute. There's been a motion in front of us. Is there discussion on the substitute? All those in favor? Aye. All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries. The substitute is before us. Now, um, we need to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Since we're on the parking su subject, real quick, uh, Mayor, is there any way to look at I know that I've parked in a, a spot and used my allowed time, and I've heard this from other people too, that they will not let you go back into that same spot again for the rest of the day. Uh, not completely accurate. Uh, Mr. President, if I can answer that. Yes, go ahead, um, Mr. Mayor. So the, the way the app works is if you, if you park in a zone, um, when your time is up, a half an hour. After a half an hour, it resets, and that's being done specifically so that people can't park there and then go over the two hour limit. The two hour limit is, you know, it's something that the businesses want. So for a half an hour, you can't park in that zone. You can park another block over in another zone immediately, um, or you can move your car and after half an hour, you'll be able to park there again. So it's not the rest of the day and it's done on purpose so that people don't leave their cars there all day and just keep refilling it through the app. Okay, thank you. You bet. So, um, Mr. Mayor, the budget amendment that you presented to us, the only change is the 30 cent fee and the fee schedule. Everything else is the same that we've heard the last couple times at Council and Committee of the Whole. With that, we'll need a resolution, I'm sorry, a motion to adopt the budget amendment as substituted. I would move the budget amendment as substituted. All right, I'm going to, any discussion? Council Member Wood. Um, I have some questions for the mayor. Um, one of the issues that I have been concerned about uh, was the lawsuit and the fact that we, when um, this was settled, we were told that it would be coming out of the sewer fee. We realized that that's part of this um, budget amendment. Could you please address that? Uh, yeah. Um, when this was all put together, this was all put into general fund, all the pieces. Um, the sewer fee is something that, that we were looking at. We were embroiled in a lawsuit um, with our, I believe, our insurance carrier. So there were pieces of it that dealt with, is it water, is it sewer? Um, it was put in here because we're halfway through the budget and we needed somewhere to put it. Um, we are going to reevaluate that for the June budget amendment. And if we can put it into the sewer fund, then we absolutely will. Um, that was a, a conversation. But again, yeah, we had to determine if it was sewer or water. So that's it, we're putting it here now, but that very well could change in June when we come to you for our, our final amendment. We're getting the legalities right on this. Um, so we started with general fund to make sure that we can get the legalities right, but when the year ends and we close the books, it, it very well could be in the sewer fund unless legal says it can't. So we're going to navigate that and give you a final decision in June. We just didn't want to put it in the wrong place now. Okay. Um, my next question has to do, there's been... Um, talk about um, the potential of recouping 
uh, or I shouldn't say recouping, but not having to pay some of the IRS um, charges and that. Um, I know you talked about the fact that um, the uh, interim finance director had been successful in some of the state um, uh, fees and having those. Could you address those issues? Yeah, um, uh, Shelby's been fantastic. Shelby Frayer has been fantastic. Uh, we navigated some of the state issues that we had and, and we did not end out getting fines um, because of her work. Um, so she's been great. Thank you all for creating a chief strategy officer who knows her thing with finance especially. Um, we have submitted two of the three years. As you all know, this is uh, we found out that there were three years that the um, that information was not provided to the federal government. We've been able to submit two of those three years. We are working on the third year, and as soon as the third year is submitted, we will absolutely file for a waiver of the fines and fees. Um, and I'd say we're hopeful that we'll get that waiver from the federal government. So we have booked it. Um, we have booked it as an expense for now. But again, when we come back to you in June, the hope is that we will have everything submitted and the feds will have waived those fees. But until we get that notification, we have to keep this as an expenditure. Um, so as soon as the third one is, is complete, um, and everyone will be happy to know we, we have already filed for our current year. Um, so we're in 20, so we've filed for 19. So we, are, we continue to be up to date now. But as soon as we get the final year from previous years completed and filed, we will request that waiver, and I can't, I can't guarantee it, but I think we're optimistic. So any additional revenue, revenues or reduction in expenditures that come in, we will be, re, we will be increasing what we're putting in, back into the reserve or rainy day fund. Correct. Reserves. The, the fund balance. We well, putting, it yeah. has many names. Well, but we've, yes. got, we've actually got two different funds. Again, I'm learning. You know this. Okay. I'm learning. We've got two different funds. Um, we've got a. Um, so yes, so the fund balance is where the dollars came from, and any dollars that come back, whether it's the federal fines and fees, whether it's moving the sewer funds, any of that, we will go. It will go right. We will give to you in a budget amendment in June, to um, yes, to be a positive, uh, to positively go into the reserves. And has there been any thought about using the remainder of the towns and ramp to offset some of these um, unforeseen? Yeah, those dollars are spoken for. They're, they were they were baked into the budget. I think Shelby addressed that two times ago. One of the times she came up, she addressed that, but those dollars are already factored in. Are factored in where? Uh, Shelby, you want to help me out where we factored those in? Those are in, in one of the budgets. Those are included. Jake, do you? Yeah. It, my understanding it was a separate fund. My understanding was that the only items that were used for that had to do with um, a um, aerial truck for um, forestry and I think an ambulance. But Count, there was council allocated about half of it, um, and then the other half, I believe, is baked into the. It, it revolves into the budget. But you guys, Mr. Frayer, can you please explain to Mr. Brower? Yeah, and so. Uh, there was the full Townsend proceeds, a majority of that was appropriated, there was a remainder of that that exists in the parking fund, and so uh, we can include that as part of net transfers and it will be reflected in the final budget amendment. Yeah, that's right, so what they did was they put it into the parking fund, again, new, new finance team, wonderful people, they put it into the parking fund not realizing that they didn't, ha didn't have to put it into the parking fund, so that will be re-reflected into into our budget that will then move into reserves. Okay, that's what I'm trying to, yes. to get to. It will go into the reserves. Uh, all of those dollars will also move into the reserves. Okay. But we're not spending it in this resolution. We're not spending it in this resolution. It's, I think it was, it, was, it was all put into the parking fund. Again, we didn't, of the many things that we had to go through when we brought in our new team, um, we didn't have a chance to discuss the, the allocation from this body a year and a half ago. And again, those dollars are supposed to stay in reserves or put in the parking fund. We will have that all worked out for the June amendment. Thank you. Into the reserves. And I have a question too, um, maybe for the mayor or for the folks that now have put themselves on the hot seat. Um, the, the dollars that we're talking about um, moving out of reserves, not all of those are being spent correctly. You're booking them as potential liabilities. So there's still some money there 
and that so it's not necessarily we have spent all those dollars but we're following GASB guidelines and basically saying we could incur these expenses so we can't we can't look at them as, as part of our uh, financial s savings that's correct okay I like it when people tell me I'm correct thank you are there other questions on the budget amendment thing oh I'm sorry Gar council member Garza thank you mr. president I guess I, I got a comment I'm gonna I'm gonna be voting no on this um, substitute for the or, I'm sorry the budget amendment and I spoke with you earlier the reason why and I just want to let public know um, with LEPFA, I mean, that's a $250,000 concession we're asking them to take, and I haven't seen any other department take that kind of concession. And with the recent coronavirus, they've had to cancel about $1.5 million worth of venues, and this is what I'm being told. And that's going to obviously uh, cause for layoffs, and I can't support layoffs. So that's why I'm annoying this. Ms. Frey, could you address LEPFA's financial station situation? Sure. So originally, um, when this amendment was brought up, uh, we took a peek at LEPFA's fund balance, which was over a million bucks when they ended uh, 2019. Um, so to ask them to take a 25% reduction from their fund balance or reserves, um, at the time, obviously, this wasn't known. Um, and that's what's included in our budget amendment. Um, however, we have asked all of our partners that we work with, including uh, Board of Water and Light, um, as obviously a large one of ours, um, in addition to um, all the other folks that we work with, um, in the community to also look at all of those contracts to see how we can get some dollars back. Obviously, we were taking a, a two-thirds reduction to our fund balance, so to ask somebody to take a 25% out of their reserve seems very reasonable. Um, given the situation now, we had communication with both Scott and Jennifer, their CFO, about uh, making sure that their cash flow isn't impacted by this, meaning that they can still make payroll um, at all times. And so again, this is a mid-year budget, uh, a mid-year budget amendment that we're asking them to take that reduction. Um, I've already had the conversation with Scott um, that if they, if they can't get to the 250, we need to talk about that before the, the June final amendment comes through. Um, that was what I, I asked. That was kind of the, the initial, here's what we'd like to get to. Now, given the, the circumstances, um, I still feel like we should approve the budget today as is, and we can amend in the final budget in June if necessary. I would just like to also point out that not passing this budget amendment means we have to look to cut $7 million out of the city expenditures, and that would be far greater uh, likelihood of layoff. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Six to two. I honestly don't know what's next. Um, the collective bargaining agreement... Uh, there are other items uh, regarding bereavement policy and parking subsidies that were agreed to, uh, but we won't bore you with the details. With that being said, I will I would move the resolution. The resolution before us. Uh, any further discussion? Council Member Wood. Just one question, and I see Shelby still here. Um, the Don't leave Shelby. <laughs> the three percent takes effect when the wage increase takes effect when. Uh, that'd be based on each collective bargaining agreement. Um, so for some, uh, like police and fire, would revert back. Um, Sorry, uh, for 243, the one we're ratifying now. Uh, February 15th, I think, was the date. Yeah, it's they don't retro back in their collective bargaining agreement, as I understand it. So it would be the date in which the contract was ratified, or February 15th, I think, was the date. Okay. Can we get that answer? You're asking when the three percent wage increase would start. Yeah, mm -hmm. they didn't. To my understanding, didn't didn't negotiate any sort of retro payment back for the beginning of the year. Okay. So as the contract gets ratified, is when the three percent would begin. Okay, when they ratified it, or when we vote on it. Which There's, are we talking about? Um, so there should be a date in which the contract takes effect, um, in which this uh, council I think is up to approve it tonight. So as long as that date in which was negotiated the, that the CBA would start is when the three percent would begin. Okay, the the contract is from. February 1st, 2019. So that would mean a year's back. I, I, you'd have to ask your labor negotiator specifics. Okay. 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 If, if we could get that, I, I, it's not going to affect my vote at all, but if we could get that, I would appreciate it. No, that's, I just need, the, I would like the information. Thank you. Okay, the motion before us is to approve the CBA with the Teamsters Local 243 CTP unit. All those in favor, please say aye. 
All opposed? Motion carries. Next item is collective bargaining agreement for the Teamsters 243 Supervisory Unit. Uh, council member Hussain. Sorry. Uh, again, this is a two-year contract. Uh, again, this includes um, a year one increase of 3%, a year two increase of 2.5%. By and large, this is uh, the same contract uh, that we just approved for our clerical, technical, and professional units. So with that being said, I move the resolution. Sure. It's been moved by council member Hussein to ratify a collective bargaining agreement, uh, Teamsters Local 243, supervisory. Any further discussion besides the question about effective date? All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed. Motion carries. Moving to the late items from Committee of the Whole, we have the deficit elimination plan for the Special Asset Capital Project Fund. Ms. Frey, would you mind just giving us a quick update on the DEP for the Special Asset? And I see that Jake left. I know it's a, it's a pro forma. We have to do this uh, to reduce the deficit in these funds, but. Um. So as Jake mentioned um, earlier in COW, um, we have a statutory requirement by the Department of Treasury if we have a deficit in one of our funds to pass a resolution or a deficit elimination plan to cover that. Um, so that's what's before you tonight. Other questions from council members? Seeing none, I'll need a motion from Council Vice President Hussein. So moved. It's been moved to adopt the deficit elimination plan. Don't go anywhere. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion carries the next step. And next we have the late item, the 2020 uh, general obligation bonds for capital improvements. Ms. Frayer, this relates to the parking fund. Would you like to elaborate? Um, yep, actually, I'm going to go ahead and bring up my bond council and municipal advisor, and they'll give you a quick summary. Oh, yeah, while we're waiting for them to come up, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to address the ratification question. So the answer is, um, in essence, they get the 3% and the 2.5% right now because they're in year two, so they're going to get a 5.5% increase, but they don't get the 3% retro back on former pay. So they will, as soon as it's ratified by both parties, they will get the first year increase, which is the three, and the second year increase is the two five. It's not retro, but they immediately get the 5.5. We'll let them know we just ratified it. Uh, bond council, question, if you could just do high level on the three bond proposals in front of us, then we'll just take them separately as motions. And the first one is the general obligation bonds for capital improvements. That's right. Thank you. Um, so capital improvement bond resolution is a not to exceed resolution for 13500 for projects presented earlier related to certain parking structure improvements within the city. Um, authorizes certain authorized officers to complete the sale of the bonds and the issuance to set the terms and authorizes the city's tax pledge publication of the notice of sale and all of the other requirements uh, to issue these bonds, sell them to the investing market. Um, approval here does not obligate the issuance, but it certainly authorizes everyone to move forward um, uh, as long as market conditions remain favorable. I can. Thank you. Okay. I would move the issuance of sale of the 2020 uh, limited tax general obligation bonds for capital improvements. Any questions from council members? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion. I'm sorry? Opposed? No? Okay. And next we have the refunding building authority bonds. That's right. This is actually city council's authorization of its limited tax pledge in favor of uh, refunding bonds, refunding uh, 2014 Tax Increment Finance Authority bonds and 2014 Lansing Building Authority bonds. Resolutions will be considered by those entities separately. In fact, uh, the TIFA considered its resolution on February 7th. Uh, so this just authorizes the city's continued support of those bonds which would be refunded for a savings. Any questions? Councilmember Hussein. I would move the issuance and sale of refunding of uh, building authority bonds and tax increment finance authority bonds. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carries. And next we have the uh, general obligation ref refunding bonds. Gentlemen. One more. Uh, not to exceed 2300000 This would refund 2010 recovery zone economic development bonds. 
those are actually taxable bonds, but under a federal program provided a credit to the city. So in exchange for that program, these refunding bonds would be issued on a tax exempt basis, again, for a savings. Are there questions from the committee? <laughs> Seeing none, oh, Council Member Wood. This was used for road work, wasn't it? for the city garage, if I recall correctly. Oh, uh, that's right. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, Council Vice President Hussein. I would move uh, the issuance and sale of limited tax general obligation refunding bonds. That mo motion has been moved. All, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. All opposed, please say nay. Motion carries. Okay, next we have the resolution extending the mayor's declaration of an emergency. Uh, Council Member Hussein. So by law, the mayor um, can only, in, sorry, issue an emergency, um, a state of emergency, sorry, for up to seven days um, without the consent of this body. Uh, so we would have to, in order for him to extend that by way of resolution, uh, we would have to, to actually support that. So what this resolution would do is extend the declaration, my understanding is to April 10th, correct? Okay, with that being said, I move the resolution. The resolution's before us. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. And next we have adopting the Lansing City Council exposure mitigation measures for COVID-19. Council Member Hussein. Okay, so this is, again, this is a resolution to adopt the Lansing City Council COVID-19 exposure, exposure mitigation measures, which include all standing committee meetings being canceled and committees being discharged of all items which are essential to city business, life safety, or welfare. Uh, the essential decisions will be considered by the Committee of the Whole and the City Council during regularly scheduled Monday evening sessions. And all Committee of the Whole meetings will be rescheduled for 5 p.m. to ensure enough time for deliberations before Council uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, that being said, I move the resolution. Thank you. Um, and just any other discussion? I'm sorry. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries. And finally, we have a resolution suspending Council Rule 46. Uh, Vice President Hussein. Yeah, I would move the suspension of Rule 46, allowing um, for, I'm sorry, which would permit participation by remote access technology, including conference calling, real time streaming, or other platforms on an action item at regular and special council meetings and official action being taken at a council meeting that includes a vote on an item for which a council member participated by remote access technology will be binding on the council and not subject subject to change except as may be provided by parli parliamentary procedure and that by the passage of this resolution each council member by his or her affirmative vote commits and agrees that he or she will not change his or her her vote at a future time when the declared state of emergency for the city is terminated and after the state of emergency is lifted will by resolution ratify each and every action taken in the meeting during the, the emergency be it vote on a resolution or ordinance sorry uh, with that being said I move the resolution thank you councilmember Hussein it's been moved I will address this just a little bit because this is the last one on this topic given that the mayor has this declared state of emergency closing down city hall the governor's further ordered school closures and no gatherings in larger than 50 it's um, our aim to uh, minimize the risk of our staff and the public in public meetings but in some cases it may be necessary to bring council members in virtually um, and right now our council rules prohibit that as soon as the state of emergency is over we will we will reinstate Rule 46 and require mandatory participation in person for quorum and for voting. It is our plan that council members uh, who are able to will still meet here in chambers and public will be able to address council members here or through writing. We will continue to encourage the public to watch our meetings if you don't wish to address council on television or through streaming services to, to keep yourself safe and at home. We hope we do not have to go this far, but um, for long but we wanted this in our back pocket should it become necessary. Um, as of now, we plan to have a council meeting next week, but I've been assured by the city attorney that as long as the uh, mayor submits his budget through electronic means and it's posted on the website before Monday, it satisfies the charter requirement to notify the city council of his budget intentions, so it might not be necessary for us to meet 
next week. Please stay tuned on that subject. We'll make that, de we'll make that decision Thursday. Um, I appreciate all of your understanding and cooperation in this time of uncertainty. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. We are to ordinances for adoption by the Committee of the Whole. We have an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend the Lansing Codified Ordinances by amending Chapter 294, Section 294.02D to eliminate the requirement that the City Attorney shall be the legal advisor to the Police and Fire Retirement Board. Is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the Committee of the Whole and is on the order of immediate passage. Councilmember Wood. Thank you. As stated uh, for the public hearing, what this does is just change one provision in the um, ordinance for police and fire, which would change the word from shall to may. And uh, we have um, been asked by the uh, retirement board and the chair, um, Eric Wolford, um, and the members of the board to pass this resolution. Uh, ordinance change, excuse me. With that, I would move the ordinance. The ordinance has been moved by Council Member Wood. Is there any further discussion? With that, would the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The ordinance is adopted. Council Member Wood. I would ask for immediate effect. Immediate effect has been asked for. All those in favor of immediate effect, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Next. We have an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend the Lansing codified ordinances by amending Chapter 292, Section 292.09 to eliminate the requirement that the City Attorney shall be the legal advisor to the Employees Retirement System Board. As read a second time by its title, the ordinance was reported from the Committee of the Whole and is on the order of immediate passage. Council Member Wood. Thank you. Again, this is changing the uh, word from the city attorney shall to may be the legal advisor for the board for the employee's retirement system. Uh, we have a letter from Chairperson Dennis Parker asking um, the council to support this change and uh, the uh, retirement board con concurred with that. With that, I would move the um, ordinance at this time. Spit. It's been moved by Council Member Wood. Is there any further discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Dunbar. Yeah. Council Member Betts. Yeah. Council Member Garza. Yeah. Council Member Hussein. Council Member Jackson. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Yeah. Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The ordinance is adopted. Council Member Wood. Um, I would move for immediate effect, please. Any, uh, all those in favor of immediate effect, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Immediate effect is ordered. Okay, we are to speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters. Uh, if you, that's the yellow sheet in the back. If you wish to address the city council, now's your last opportunity to put your name on that yellow sheet. And in the meantime, we are to reports of city officers, boards, and commission. Vice President. I would move that all items be considered read in full and that the proper referrals meet, uh, be made by the president. It's been moved by Council Member Hussein. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We have items from the city clerk regarding minutes of boards, commissions, and authorities. Place them on file. Uh, Department of Neighborhood and Citizen Engagement Annual Report. Committee of the Whole. And Lansing Housing Commission Financial Reports. Committee of the Whole. Items from the mayor regarding noise special permit for E.T. McKenzie. Um, general services. Uh, funding application for local bridge program for fiscal year 2023. Uh, Mr. Mayor, are those timely? It's, it's the local bridge funding program. Mm -hmm. Ways and means for now. Uh, street, name. street name change, renaming City Market Drive to Riverfront Drive. Committee of the Whole. Uh, annual consolidated strategy and plan submission for CDBG funds. Committee of the Whole. Collective bargaining agreement, Teamsters 243 CTP. Committee of the Whole in place and file. Uh, collective bargaining agreement, uh, Teamsters 243 Supervisory. Committee of the whole place on file. Reappointment of Cassandra Nelson to the Historic District Commission. The Committee on Development and Planning. Items from Councilmember Betts, an ordinance to eliminate the prohibition on street parking between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Public service. Uh, ordinance to um, uh, eliminate annual and temporary permits for overnight street parking. Public service. Ordinance to regulate on-street parking during snow emergencies. 
public service. Communications and petitions, an affidavit of disclosure from Cherise Fleming of the Lansing Police Department. Ethics Board. Affidavit of disclosure, Michael Van Beek of the Lansing Police Department. The Ethics Board. Claim appeal, John Bloomer for 435 in grass and weed fees. Uh, Committee on General Services. And a joint appointment, Monica Janer to the Ingham County City of Lansing Community Corrections Advisory Board. The Committee on Public Service. We are two remarks by... I'm sorry, yes. Um, I'd like to address item four. Uh, that's the Community Corrections Board that normally goes to public safety. Um, it deals with... That was probably a typo. Um, okay. Committee, uh, Mr. Clerk, please refer that to the Committee on Public Safety. Okay, we are two remarks by council members. I have one remark I just want to report. Um, the, the Lansing School District Board of Education has made the determination to suspend their search for superintendent at this time in related to the COVID-19 um, outbreak. They plan to have a meeting this week on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. for public input and decided against bringing a large group of public together to provide input and transmission. So that will be canceled as well as their Thursday, March 19th, 6.30 p.m. board meeting will be canceled. Um, the school board president has announced that um, scheduled uh, meetings will be allowed, will be, will, replacements for those meetings will be an, announced shortly and they anticipate picking their search process back up in April. Did that give you enough time, Mr. Clerk? Yes. Very good. Any other council members wish to make final comments? Thank you. Remarks by the mayor. I'll just add that things are moving so quickly that while we've been sitting here, the governor issued an executive order that people, that we can't have any more than 50 people in one place meeting. I think it was at 640 she issued it, so things are moving fast. <laughs> okay, public comment on city government related matters. We have David Reed followed by Lillian Young. Good evening, uh, members of the City Council and Mayor Shore. My name is David Reed. I'm a resident of the City of Lansing. I'm a Christian Democrat, and I'm in a joint operating agreement with the American Civil Liberties Union. I bring legal actions that clarify and expand the rights of the poor and homeless. And for you new members, of the Lansing City Council. You're no doubt unaware of the fact that this body politic is attempting to flee and elude major legal actions that point out that rescue missions are actually concentration camps. Those who have to work for free in them to stay there are actually slaves and with no right to life. Uh, if you check with the city attorney. He'll show you the major cases I brought uh, involving the city of Lansing and that I, I argued before the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, the problem I'm having at this point is that uh, it would appear that Mayor Shore and uh, Representative Sarah Anthony are ganging up on me to commit a crime. And the crime is MCLA 750.478, willful neglect of duty. Uh, what happened is, is I got banished from the Capital Area District Library on uh, January 2nd because there was a small insect on my sleeve which I killed. And uh, this is the code of conduct from uh, the CADL. Uh, and uh, it states that um, uh, no patrons are to have fleas, lice, or bed bugs. Can anyone identify what a, a flea is, lice, or a bed bug if they see it? This is a world full of insects. And uh, quite frankly, to banish me because there was a small insect on my sleeve is outrageous. And as you saw, those rules wouldn't have banished me if I had a tarantula on my leg. It's fleas, lice, and bedbugs that they zeroed in on. 
that the Fourth Amendment protects me from arbitrary and capricious rules brought by the library. And I'm claiming that I'm exempt from these rules because of the Fourth Amendment, and I'm asking you folks to save me from Mayor Shore and from citizen advocate Mark Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Lillian Young, followed by Daniel K. Arnold. Uh, good evening. Hi, my name is Lillian Young. I am a graduate student at MSU, and I live in the first ward. And last Wednesday, before everything happened with COVID-19, I was given notification on my car, a little flyer that said I would have to pay to park in front of my house. Um, as a graduate student, I am also an art student, and I don't have that much money. I spend about half of my paycheck on supplies alone, which means about every two weeks or so, I spend about $400 in order to sustain supplies to make pieces that I need to make for grades in order to keep my scholarships, in order to keep my insurance from MSU, and I really don't have it in my budget to pay $125 every year, because I will probably forget to, in order to park in front of my house, but I also live in a neighborhood where I know for a fact not a lot of my neighbors have that in their budget. I live in a household where there are three of us, and we all have individual cars, and we have one driveway. So it's really not possible for all three of us to budget to buy three $125 permits, especially when two of us have to park out on the street all the time. And also, I don't think this permit really takes into account what if we have, I'm not from here, I'm from Texas, so if my family drives up or if I have relatives from Indiana come and visit me, I don't want to have to say, hey, you can come stay with me at my place, but be sure to stop by like downtown so you can get that three-day parking pass and you won't get a ticket. And even if you have the parking pass, if you're in a household like mine where you have multiple cars, there's a chance that you can only buy one ticket. And if you have multiple cars and they don't have it, those tickets for you parking between two and five are going to build up and can eventually get to above 125. I also have neighbors where one of them is a single mom with two kids. She could not pay some bills for a while and she had to work out that. I have neighbors who are handicapped. Essentially, this whole permit thing, it does not make sense. Maybe for places in Lansing that have more money, but for the first ward where I live, we don't really have that much money to go around. Uh, I had to get my car fixed and that completely screwed up my budget for like three weeks. So I ask that you guys please get rid of this permit and please let it so we can just park in front of our houses at night and not have to worry about a police officer coming giving us a ticket when we're trying to rest so we can go and work so we can make a living and just have a good life. Thank you. Thank you and our final speaker is Daniel K. Arnold. I'm Daniel Arnold. I adore my city. This region means the world to me, and I care about everyone here. Many aspects of life in Lansing have been discontinued right now due to the coronavirus. Things are changing. Police officers are becoming limited when they are needed most. So much is going on, my heart goes out to a friend who needs diapers for a two-year-old and the many vulnerable homeless who see themselves social distance out of enough shelter for everyone. It's like all the shelters are saying we only hold, hold this many people, so it's just there's no way that they're going to have a place to go, so it's just going to be terrible. But doors are closing and the homeless are limited to small capacity day shelters. What can we do? Are there any buildings not in use that could keep the most vulnerable populations off the street? The nonprofits can only do so much. Considering opening additional building rooms such as Lansing centers or abandoned buildings to accommodate the poor who usually fill the shelter to old capacity at times of high volumes, this is a state of homeless emergency. Please do something. Any of you, let's form a focus group to meet these needs. Online, uh, Mayor Shore, Adam Hussein, Brian T. Jackson, Jeremy Garza, Patricia Splitsey, uh, 
uh, Carol Wood, Peter Spadafore, Brandon Betts, Kathy Dunbar. I'm willing to meet with any of you for a phone conference. This is doable. Please reach out to me on Facebook, Guy Smiley, G-U-Y-S-M-I-L-I-E. I, I just, you know, we're not talking about this. Maybe you just don't know that, like, everyone's going to the different shelters. They're saying, Jimmo, tw- this is where all the mental health consumers in our whole city, Jimmo, 20 people can come in. Uh, BOA, 20 people can come in at a time. Uh, the outreach, everybody likes uh, some low number, like 20 or 30 can be there at a time. So I don't know where all these people who are homeless and are very health vulnerable to what the coronavirus does. Those people don't know where to go. They're, they're, they're going to have a lockdown at the city rescue mission to keep people there all day, just keep them from each other. But there's a lot of homeless out here that are unaccounted for that are just going to they're just going to be like, where do I go? They're going to be lining up in front of places, and, and, and then the police are having less action, less than before. I, I'm just really, really my heart grieves for them because uh, uh, these, these people have more to think about than just toilet paper. Thank you. Thank you. That was our final speaker. There's our final um, item for the evening. I just want to note this was one of our longer meetings, but it makes up for all the short ones that I got you through in the last couple of weeks. So with that, we are adjourned.